order the select board meeting for recording in progress Monday, January 3rd. First order of business is to approve the agenda unless there's any changes. Do you have paper copy? Uh, I've got this one. I can it's okay. Do. You can keep that one. I have it in my email. I just need one moment. I was going to say, I'll just. Here we go. Mm -hmm. uh, do you all want? I'll take one. I'll take one. That's yeah, the only thing I'll have. Because that way I don't have to go back and forth. Uh, in the meantime, I'll okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's what I do. All right. And wasn't there today to help Bill get prepared? <laughs> <laughs> we miss you. The ship falls apart when you're not here, Carla. Uh, it's a pretty short agenda, so we have the consent agenda items, minutes yes. from the last meeting, liquor license, there's a list of them, public. Select board businesses uh, consider Most. applying for a state carrying for canopy urban forestry grant, tree planting and roadside ash removal, and then manager's items is fire contract, review 2021 budget, and then generally discuss 2022, that's it. I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. All right, is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, um, first is consent agenda items. Minutes from December 14th meeting, and then liquor licenses for craft beer seller, Crossroads Discount Beverage, Smuggler's Notch Distillery, and Billings Mobile. Oh, did we lose something? I move to approve the consent agenda as listed. All right, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you, Bill. Do we lose? I think we lost the Our video. video. Yeah, well, thanks, Bill. It seems like audio is still going. No, no it was a red flash. Oh. The light just came on when you did that. Now it went off. You, again. you just lost the. Uh, hit that button you hit. It's a microphone. Oh, set to, yep. We just lost our. Is that on line. or off though? That's off. Oh. So it looks like it's just off. Steve, if you hit this. You um, can't get the. Oh. <laughs> this happened before. Yeah. I'm going to have to restart the meeting. So, yeah, I think so. Can we, can we look at my. <laughs> We've been having some trouble with the Wi-Fi here. Um, I'm going to have to end, end this and yeah, he start the he can't. owl meeting. Can, um, can the that people that are in the meeting hear us? Carla, can you hear us when we, when we say we got to restart the meeting so anyone who's in there needs to log back in? Uh, I don't nope. think they're <laughs> Yeah, the Zoom's frozen. I'm, I'm sorry, we've That's been okay. having issues with the setup here. I thought it was fine. Y2K resistance. Is that a Bob Butler fix? Is he the man to deal with that? Let's oh, make sure this turns on properly. Um, Hopefully they're still there. Yeah. I don't know if they can hear us. Carla, can you hear us? She, she's probably texting somebody. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. If you hit the. Uh...
got the meeting. I'm going to give them a couple minutes because I think the only public I saw was Tom and I. Well, and then Orca. But he's Stops responding. We did something. Let's see how long it lasts. Um, the recording. Can you hit record? Yeah. Can you hit record again? Good call. Recording in progress. Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and try. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but looks like we have everyone we had prior to us crashing. So um, now is the public remarks section. This is an opportunity for the public to speak on. Anything that's not on the current agenda. Um, looks like the only person I see is Tom and Meg. I don't know if you had anything for public remark before we move into select board business. Okay. Um, we will move forward with select board business. Consider applying for a state caring for canopy urban forestry grant and tree planting. Yeah, sorry, all set. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yep, no problem. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll come over here where you can hear me a little bit better. So each year um, we've been applying for state urban forestry funding. Last year we funded uh, for a combination of tree planting and uh, roadside ash removal. And uh, we'd like to apply again. Um, the state has um, total of $50,000 available. Uh, and so we definitely want to do a planting. Um, and the two um, <coughs> front and back that are at your spots are, um, one is in uh, Pilgrim Industrial Park. There's a section of Lower Railroad Street um, that has no trees. It's across from the parking lot that was built where the freight house uh, was, Station Lumber. And um, so we have permission from uh, Wayne Lamberton, who's a, a partner in Malone Properties that owns um, really the whole uh, Pilgrim Industrial Park now. And um, he's fine with us planting trees there. The uh, right of way for Railroad Street is quite narrow. It's only, um, I think, something like 17 feet wide. But the state will allow us to uh, plant trees with grant funding with a written agreement with the private property owner. And uh, they would be street trees, uh, we would plant them, they'd be warranted, uh, planted by Evergreen Gardens, and um, you know, we would establish them. And um, so that uh, would qualify for the grant funds. Uh, the other project is at Hope Davy Park, so if you flip your paper over, um, this is the area by the picnic shelter that uh, we worked on this uh, past year. The highway department expanded the parking lot to create another bay of parking, and they're going to add a um, uh, timber barrier down the middle of the parking lot, similar to the other parking lot off Loomis Hill. Uh, we planted two trees this past summer with uh, funding, uh, it was an Arbor Day planting. We planted a celebration maple and renovated, um, it's in the middle of the hexagonal uh, commemorative bench there. And we planted a heritage river birch. Uh, these are trees that tolerate wet conditions. The underlying soils uh, get very wet in that particular area, like, like a lot of Waterbury Center. And uh, so what we'd like to do is plant four more uh, Heritage River Bridge that would be between the expanded parking lot and the picnic shelter, and they're shown on this uh, planting plan. And then we want to plant a uh, swamp white oak. Uh, they do well in wet conditions. We planted two at uh, Daskam Row Field down by Winooski Street last year. So there'd be a total of 12 trees. Um, I've got uh, talked to uh, Mike McLeod with Evergreen Gardens today. Um, tree cost has gone up. Mm -hmm. uh, it would actually be about $7,000 for the trees. Um, so what we'd like to do is um, 
have you authorize um, a project uh, budget that would uh, not exceed $10,000. The grant funds will cover basically 50% of the project cost, so it's, a, it's an equal match. We would do a cash match, um, and uh, probably, I've talked to Bill about this, um, we'd probably go through uh, highway department budget. And uh, so it would be up to a $5,000 grant and then up to a, a $5,000 cash match. Um, I say up to that, um, we're, we're having some conversation to the state since there's only $50,000 available. We may scale it back to do just the planting this year and maybe do another ash removal. But we'd like you to authorize um, the, the full project um, it would be a $10,000 budget, a $5,000 grant request. <coughs> the applications are due this Friday. So uh, this is a project for the tree committee. So uh, Jane Brown with the tree committee is um, offered to assist in uh, putting together the, the grant application. So that, that's really the project in a nutshell. It will complete the, the planting renovation, if you will. It, at Hope Baby Park, and then it will actually complete the um, street tree planting for Railroad Street. So it will be a nice addition to our urban forestry program and, and complete the plantings for those uh, two areas. Steve, any idea on how many grants that they plan to award? Um, I don't know. I've got a um, call into the program director, and uh, I'd like to get her advice. So I should hear back from her in a day or two and just um, see, as I say, uh, as I mentioned, we may scale the project back a little bit to do just the planting, but um, we'd, we'd like to have that option of, uh, we would, uh, if we did the full project, we would put $3,000 towards removal of some additional roadside ash. And then probably do the same project. Uh, the tree committee is, uh, willing to do the bucking and splitting. We, we um, sold the firewood. We sold uh, seven cords this uh, past fall <coughs> with the last project and raised almost uh, $2,000 to split between the uh, Good Neighbor Fund and the uh, Waterbury Rotary Charitable Fund. So we um, had, we sold the firewood I mentioned, and uh, for tax deductible donations that went directly to those uh, charities. So um, if we go that route, we would do a similar project, but to scale back from what we did this past year. Just out of curiosity, um, <clears throat> what were the, uh, what was the price on the trees prior to? So uh, the trees were um, about, uh, let's see, 12, it, they're about $500 a piece planted, and Mike estimates that the cost has gone up about 10%, um, and it's, it's not just the nursery cost, it's trucking. As in, in a lot of industries right now, trucking costs have gone up um, a lot. Yep. And um, so I talked to Mike today, and he's gonna get me a quote by the end, of, you know, before the end of the week to include that he thought that it would be, uh, originally it thought it would be about $6,000, he's telling us the budget seven, based on the conversation I had with him. And the other probably insignificant question is, uh, you know, anytime you plant trees in the fall, those trees shed leaves, and how much of a pain is it for from a maintenance perspective? Because I know the big maples that I got at home, when they drop their leaves, it's like, ridiculous trying to deal with them yeah uh, do we have we don't have bags on the mowers right or do they just mulch in, mulch into the ground yeah I, we don't bag them as far yeah. as I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah do we have does the work release crew do some leaf pickup mm -hmm. I, you know, we deal with it on all the parks. Yeah, I'm uh, just curious. Yeah. no exception. Yeah. Uh, along Railroad Street, we really haven't had issues. I think in these open areas, the leaves tend to disperse 
Uh, these trees would be about 40 feet apart, so it's not like a dense grove. But even at Hope Davy, we find that uh, I mean, it's not a huge issue. Street trees, we end up, you know, we pick a fair amount up with the street sweeper, you know, and bucket loads and stuff like that along the streets. But yeah, I mean, that's it's not, a big, it's not a big deal, I don't think, Chris. Steve, totally understand the supply chain, you know, issues that's happening and everything. But should like, you know, these trees are probably not going to go in until spring. Should things change around? Is is there some flexibility if costs go down then? Um, we can all know. There probably would be. I don't think costs would go down. It may more be an availability issue where right. a two to two and a half inch caliper tree may not be available. We may have to go to an inch and three quarters to two inch. And I think the state's gonna experience this from lots of municipalities, right. that there has to be more flexibility. Right, totally understand. Yeah, Just curious. So, so I think, yeah, we would stick with these species. We might have to adjust the sizes around a little bit. Okay. But the overall project would be similar. Anyone else have questions? And then the motion would be, you're always going to try to match, so for some reason the grant comes in at three, does that mean that the cash match is three then? Or Correct, we... yeah. So I think the motion would be to authorize Bill to sign the grant application for um, a total of $10,000. Total of 10000 With a $5,000 grant matching match. match. Not right. to exceed 10 Right, including the 5000 Right. right. So moved. <laughs> All right. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Will you keep us posted? Yes, definitely keep you posted. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. All right. Manager's items. Duxbury Fire Contract. Okay, I didn't <coughs> send that out until today, I think, but. Um, with Danny's benefit, uh, a couple things as we start the budgeting process. Um, uh, there are certain elements of the budget that are kind of pro forma that have been in the budget for quite some time. And uh, the uh, fire contract with the town of Duxbury is one of those items. Uh, the, the contract uh, basically, uh, we provide first response fire protection to almost all of Duxbury. There's about 13% of Duxbury's grand list down near Howard Union High School that Moortown covers on first response. Uh, a number of years ago, we developed this particular contract structure where the two towns basically pay for the fire department as if the total grand list of the two towns together were being used to pay that. So they're paying the same fair share as Waterbury is of, of our fire department budget. Um, so uh, what we do is we look back to the past year. So the 2021 budget ended at, uh, when I did this last week, 772,895. And we take that number and then we use the equalized grand education grand list, which we get from the state's website, and do the math. And it comes out to a contract for 2022-2023, uh, April 1st and March 31st of $120,570. So it was 115 and change in 2021 to 2022. So I sent this to the Duxbury Select Board last week, told them that I would try to get you to, uh, you the Select Board to approve this. Now every year what I tell them and you is that the $772,000 uh, spending that we had, I try to project uh, bills that are gonna come in in 2020, uh, in early 2022. But they need information early enough so they can do the budget. So typically, uh, our fire, year end fire expenses typically are a little bit higher than we uh, base the contract on. It only usually would amount to a couple thousand dollars. And rather than 
risk $120,000 revenue by nickeling and dining them for an extra $500 or $1,000. We just say kind of that's it. Um, if you read the email that I forwarded to you, I think I sent you the whole thing uh, where I sent the email to Marie Pratt, um, the chairperson of the board over there. About three years ago, they questioned the discount of uh, 13 or 17 percent. We build them 83 percent of their grand list total. Um, which means about 17% of the value of their town is not included in this. And a few years ago, they said, well, we're not sure that's the right number. It might be better for us. And I said, well, we'll have to look and we'll have to recalculate. And they didn't, they didn't take me up on that a couple of years ago. So this year I told them, I said, this is the contract arrangement that we've had. Um, I think it would be to our, both of our benefits if we revisit to make sure that 83% is the right number. Uh, and what I suggested as a carrot to get them to do it is to say, let's sit down together, Dan Sweet, who's our appraiser, is their appraiser as well. Um, sit down with Dan and myself and a couple select board members from Duxbury along with Gary Dillon make sure we draw the circle around the right part of Duxbury that is supposed to be ex excluded, and then let Dan figure out what the value of that excluded area is. And uh, what I told them is I would recommend to the select board to approve this contract as is with 12570 as the number, and then told them that if we would do that math, that I think should be done because it hasn't been adjusted probably in 15 years now. Um, if we if we do that math and it's to Duxbury's benefit, I would recommend that we give them the benefit and lower the contract price as if we do this before <coughs> the first installment is due. And if it's benefit to Waterbury, we'll leave it as is now and then next year we'll we'll true it up. So my recommendation is to have you offer, formally offer this contract of 125.70 to Duxbury for the period April 1st, 22 to March 31st, 23. Questions from the board? Uh, the only question I do have, I know uh, Gary's going to meet with Duxbury select board members. Would he want to have a Waterbury select board member there? Well, if a select board member wants to go, that's fine. I mean, the, right. what I proposed is Gary and myself, and okay, Duxbury I, doesn't have a manager, so. Right. Yeah. That's fine. I, maybe I didn't hear what you were going to be. Interested. No, no. Me, myself, Gary, Dan Sweet, and the Duxbury select board member or two. Nothing for it to say. Okay. And, and Bill, it looks, it looks like anytime we have debt associated with the fire department, that gets included in this budget, which I see the last three line items are the capital improvement yep. principle and interest. So when we take on large expenses, they share in that. Yep. Okay. Yep. And uh, uh, I specifically put that back in a couple of years ago and went over and told them that, hey, you know, we've got a million dollars worth of fire trucks that you're using as well. So right. yes, that's yeah, exactly. that's included. Because most of the other debt that we have gets paid out of right. CIP that's, funds. Yeah, and I, mo <laughs> I moved this back to make sure that was included. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you agree with this, but I mean, over the years, we've cut them a little slack from time to time. Um, but, you know, in cases like you just said, when CIP, you know, when the fire department requires a higher budget, that goes into the calculation. I think our I think our goal here is to uh, not to make money on the town of Duxbury. It's just simply to provide them with a fire service that's adequate and uh, uh, as yeah. long as you know both parties are, are yeah. uh, fairness. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we're. It. I think yeah. that this will continue to be a good relationship. Yeah, and I think you know almost every time a new select board gets 
elected over there. They think that oh, this is this Waterbury's getting rich off of us. <laughs> and then you go over and you explain it, and then you tell them that you've got 55 firefighters and all the training they go through and all the equipment that we purchase, and it's all available to them. Uh, and then you know they look at their alternative, which is trying to figure out how to drum up 10 people to be their own volunteer fire department, and they think it's not a bad deal. And have the facilities to house all the equipment. Yeah, exactly. And maintain all the equipment exactly. and have the, all, all the equipment and, and so on and so on, you know. It's, uh, so I think it works both ways. And like I said, I, I don't want to nickel and dime them. You know, we give them, I make my best estimate at this time of year. And so if it passes now and then it does end up needing to change, you would bring it to a board meeting and we would vote on making that change or yeah, it would just be yeah a so what what i envision danny is i would hope that sometime in february or march you know after we get through the budget period that we could have this meeting mm -hmm. gary would help us identify the areas make sure everybody's in agreement with it then dan sweet would do the calculations and if we did it and it turned out that they should get a 20% discount instead of a 70% discount, we'd calculate that and then uh, revisit the contract. And I'd bring it back here to tell the board, you know, uh, my recommendation is to allow the contract to be adjusted down by $3,000 or whatever. So yeah, it would come back here. Other questions from the board? Uh, motion? Yep, the motion would be to um, approve uh, the proposed fire contract with Duxbury for the period April 1, 2022 to March 31, 2023 as presented. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, next, review 2021 budget. Okay, um, again, uh, to refresh all of your memories and to bring Danny up to speed, um, January is a really busy month for us. Uh, we're really lucky. There's five Mondays in January. And, uh, I think we should plan that there'll be a meeting on every one. Maybe if we get lucky, we won't need it on the, on the last Monday of the month, but uh, chances are we will. Um, what typically happens, and you're the only one who hasn't been through this pleasurable process yet, um, is that uh, you know this first meeting it's first of all it's very early it's oftentimes not until the sixth or seventh so it's earlier this year than normal uh, and it's right hard off the holidays so I did take a little time during the holidays and didn't work constantly uh, over Christmas or New Year's so this first meeting will pretty much just review where we stand at the end of 2021. Um, I always explain to the board that the numbers that you see as the year to date numbers now will likely go up in terms of the expenditures because bills that come in that were for goods or services that we bought in 2021 will have to be posted back. So electric bills, phone bills, heating fuel, diesel fuel, potentially salt for the highway department. Um, the training that we had a couple weeks ago from Mary Gannon, she hasn't built us the, for that yet. So anything that we did in 2021 will get posted back. So the numbers that I'm showing in this budget today in the second column to the right, you know, budget and then the year to date column, that year to date column is likely to go up uh, I believe the projected column, if you look at the projected columns uh, that I have for 2021 are higher than the year to date columns. And that's my best guess right now as to what will happen over the next few weeks. Um, and then uh, what will happen is that I will present 
budgets to the board. We'll talk about the general government budget and the general fund tonight. We'll talk about the health and social services budget a little bit tonight. Um, and I take care of presenting a number of the budgets that don't have department heads, if you will. Um, and then probably on the 17th of January, two weeks from tonight, Steve will come in uh, to talk about the planning budget. Maybe Gary Dillon will come in to talk about the fire budget. Next week, we'll probably have Nick in the recreation budget. Um, we'll probably have some people from uh, the Senior Citizen Center, some of the bigger groups that request appropriations. They come in to tell us what their, what their plans are for the year. So uh, as we move through, I'll make changes, not so much based on what you folks say tonight, uh, but as we move forward, there'll be presentations made uh, from department heads. I'll ask you as we go through the process to preliminary approve uh, departmental budgets just to make sure that we have a general consensus on where we are. And then uh, I'll make changes between meetings. Uh, as I said in my email yesterday, I'll do my best to try to get information out to you by late in the day Saturday, certainly I'd like to be, have it no later than noon on Sunday to give you a little time to look at it. If I meet my goal of getting it out on Saturday, you'll have a whole day and a half or so to look at it. Um, anyway, um, and then as we move forward, things will solidify and individual budgets that looked good when they were presented might look in the aggregate that it's not what you folks want and we'll make adjustments and fine tune. I'm hopeful that on the 24th, I will present to you a budget that is really pretty close to what I think it, I think will be uh, in, in, uh, in compliance with your, with your review as we go forward. And then if we have to meet that last Monday of the month, it will be really for fine tuning and, and just kind of cleaning up loose ends. So that's where we'll, what the process is like. Um, I pretty much work every day during January from now until we're finished. So if you need something, you know, the best way is to just email me. If you have a question, let me know. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Hopefully it won't be too painful. Um, so to review 2021, as I said in my memo, um, in one respect, this will might not have to be a very painful process at all because we have significant, significant fund balances going into 2022, uh, mainly due to the fact that we were very conservative a year ago when we budgeted for um, revenue that was coming from the state. Uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic and uh, all of what we dealt with in 2020, uh, layoffs and, and pulling back spending to, because we just didn't know what things were gonna happen uh, in 2020 and going into 2022, we we're still pretty uncertain. Um, I talked to the board a year ago at this time and said, you know, we should really maybe plan for a significant uh, decrease in state payments, especially those that are uh, dependent on sales tax revenues, which uh, that's the pilot payments. Uh, so we budgeted far less. Uh, you can see on the, if you look at the revenue page, uh, in the general fund, we budgeted $160,000 for a pilot and we ended up taking in 330,000. So because we had significant revenues from the state in that same case, that same situation is the case for the forest and parks revenue and the current use revenue, all of which, you know, about three times what we budgeted. So, so can I stop you right there? Yeah. On pilot, is there like a year delay? Like are, are we potentially going to see a, a strong, was there a drop that we know of in, within, I got to imagine there was a drop in room in the meals tax at some point and 
are we just maybe never going to see? Yeah, um, you know, Mark, I don't, I don't know for certain. I'll try to find out from the folks at the League of Cities and Towns a little yeah. bit more. But, you know, 2021, um, I mean, 2020, there, there's a lag. So the state uses sales tax revenue that ends on July 1st of 2021 to fund what we would get in calendar year 2022. And they use the values of the buildings as of April 1st, the prior year. So everything is a year behind. And I would have thought that given that we had virtual lockdowns and places were closed in 2020, that 2021 would have been the year where we saw mm -hmm. steep declines. Um, my, my guess would be just based on how much I went out to restaurants and the restaurants that I see open, it seems like there were more of them open in 2021 than there were in 2020 during the midst of the, the high points of the, of the pandemic. But I'll try to make sure, but um, nothing on this page, I haven't proposed anything yet for 2022 revenues but we budgeted 160 to come in in November of 2021 and 330,000 came in. Right, I'm just, what, I was just asking for a clarification maybe there because I'm right. interested to see what you put in as a- as Yeah, a, and, I, and, and I, haven't, I haven't put that in yet because I don't have uh, information. My guess is that somehow the state, you know, they may have used some of their federal money, you know, there's, there's been, before, before ARPA, you know, there was COVID relief money that came a year ago. So the state may have used that to backfill and, and try to get this. This is local option tax. So really money that maybe left restaurants and went to groceries, well, I guess certain groceries, but some of that might have actually just balanced. Yeah, out and, out and you know, so the local option tax, it's rooms and meals, sales, and, and uh, rooms and meals, alcohol, and sales. Now, sales probably went up, you know, uh, in terms of people buying online. You get that tax now. Oh, right. uh, so if you're buying from, you know, Amazon or Walmart uh, online, they've got to pay that local option tax to Williston or wherever, so. So the local option tax is for online purchases if you're I think towns. if I think right. if you have a brick and mortar building in a particular town, yeah. that that town, if you, you know, and I don't know all the ins and outs of how it works, but clearly, uh, we were expecting. We weren't expecting, but we were prepared for a huge drop, and fortunately, you know, it didn't happen. So we end up, we're pretty flush going into 2022. And can, uh, can you just remind everyone what the Forest and Parks income is? Uh, Perry Hill, right? Mm -hmm. Goes Perry across Hill. and it yes. goes up the Worcester Range. Does well, it? there's a gap and then it starts up again around right. on the earth. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, if you think about the acreage that's involved, they're, they're paying us, you know, percentages of pennies on the dollar. Uh, but it's still, you know, it's, it's, um, so it's ninety ninety two thousand dollars that we get to put in our budget. If it was privately owned, you know, would have hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxes on it. And that comes but, out of that's use fees. That's where this money is generated, or, what's mm -hmm. the, or is this just a percentage of estimated value, and that's it? Yeah, they've they've changed their formula in the last couple of years, and uh, they've uh, they value the forest, and then they, there's a percentage. Uh, we used to get, we used to get in the, uh, up until about four years ago, we were getting in the low $60,000. So they changed the formula and it bumped us up about 30 grand from what we used to get. Uh, and, and then the, um, the other thing that's in that forest and parks, um, um, 
it's not only the forest land, but in that, no, no, I'm sorry, in the, um, in the regular pilot for, that we got the 330,000, um, structures at uh, state parks are included there. So the value of lean-tos and the ranger stations and whatever outbuildings are at the uh, Little River State Park and the Center State Park, we get that's, that's included there. And then the current use is for people who have uh, who have open land and they you know they've signed up for the use value uh, taxation. So they get a they get a lower tax bill, and the state uh, makes up part of that uh, lost revenue to the towns. So that's what that is. Who knows? In the near future, we might have a lot of item here that's for theft theft and use. Because apparently. I think it's the state passed a bill that if you steal something, you're supposed to claim it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. Wow. <laughs> wow. I wonder how many takers they have. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> continuing to look at the revenue page of the 2021 budget, <laughs> we did. Um, receive a big donation from Albertsons in the recreation program. That was a $60,000 grant. And we used that money uh, to buy, to put towards two vans, as it turns out. And if you look at the, I don't, I haven't totaled it. I'm sure Nick will do it when he comes in to talk with you next week. But uh, if you look at the <coughs> revenue that we generated from the, uh, the recreation programs and the pool, and the like, it's significantly above what we anticipated. The mini camp income, mm -hmm. you know, 470% of what we, of what we um, <clears throat> proposed. And that's basically all of the after school camps and um, camps that we've had to try to provide a place to go for kids during the pandemic when other things are closed. So, um, you know, Nick did a really good job of <clears throat> again, second year in a row, being pretty nimble and fortunately have been able to uh, get enough staff to run these programs and take in that revenue. Um, I didn't do the tally, but I know that the net cost for recreation programs is significantly lower than, still costing the taxpayers money, but the tax, uh, more of, more of the programming have been covered by revenue this year than has been ever. Do, do you and Nick have any kind of inkling <coughs> if we might see any Albertson money next year? Uh, or is that have, just have, not, have not been, uh, in, no indication of that yet. Okay. No indication of that yet. Um, also on here, and I put in my memo, if you look down to the bottom of that first page, <coughs> We have a $50,000 transfer from the tax stabilization fund to the general fund that we budgeted. And we've got this tax stabilization fund, Danny, I think I've talked about this in the past, but uh, started when uh, Duxbury and Waterbury put our uh, K-8 to school system, pre-K-8 to school system together. Duxbury bought into the equity at the uh, what at the time was the Waterbury Elementary School. They paid us, I think it was $644,000. And we took that money and we've invested it. And then uh, we, when we have years when there's a reasonable gain, uh, we've, we had a very complicated formula before. Uh, now we basically are able to take up to 5% of the year end value. That's the current policy. And last year, the fund ended at about a million dollars in value, so we could transfer $50,000 from the tax stabilization fund to the general fund. Um, I didn't make the transfer yet because although the tax stabilization fund did very well, I haven't got the last statement yet for December, but uh, I don't think we really need the money this I year. So <laughs> I, I, would just, I would just leave it where it is. Yeah, we shouldn't move it out. I don't think there's a, the only reason you'd move it out is if we really needed it to fulfill the budget, right? Yeah. Okay. 
that they keep making money. Yeah, that's what, that's what I would do. Yeah. And, and you know, we can, we can talk about 2022, you know, when we yeah. move forward. We might want to include it in the budget. But this year, I don't, I don't think we need it right now. Yeah. And uh, if it turns out at the end, we decide we want to do it, we can still move it, and I can still post that transfer back to 2021 if that's really what the board wants to do. Because if we don't move, if we were to move it, it just goes into the coffers of the additional cash positions that we already have, right? Yeah, I mean, it's but one of those things not, where it's... What's that? But there it's not at risk. I mean, well, it's, it's only $50,000 of, of what'd you say? A million. Yeah. A million and seven. Over a million, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but I look at it this way. If, if you're doing so well, doesn't hurt to skim a little off the top to benefit the purpose it was put there, which is to help the people of the town. And if we can put it into our overall budget and either help prevent taxes from rising up a little bit or use it to, you know, save money uh, on something else, I, th I think it's, you know, the purpose for in which the tax stabilization fund has met its goal and done what it's done for us, now I think it's important that we utilize that to, you know, to help the purpose that it was made for. But I think that might be short-sighted. We have incomes that came in significantly higher. For example, pilot, that $50,000 we budgeted last year was because we didn't know we were going to get those high revenues. To I think if you look at on a on a long term macro level, leaving money either invested or not spending it now if we can avoid it, I think will pay in droves later to be a better tax stabilization fund. I think if we take money out, we don't necessarily need to because basically there's a good chance that we're still going to calculate out that we should put it into the budget for 2022. The question is, do we do 2021s? We, we put it in there to get to a tax rate that we presented to the voters, but I don't necessarily think if we, if we can avoid the movement of that money, and that money can't potentially, I think the market's proven over time, it returns 7%. I know there's a certain position amount of cash or less risk within yeah. the portfolio. There's a calculation there that also we make sure that as the portfolio grows, that we take some risk out over time. Correct me if I'm wrong there. So. I don't think there's a lot of risk to leave it in there, and I think long term it's better to not, if you don't have to take money out, I really think it should stay. Yeah, and, and, to, and to be clear, uh, in the first paragraph of, of the memo that I sent out, uh, in, in that, uh, well, I don't have the balance sheet here, but um, I said the December 31st uh, balance in the town's cash operating fund, so in the People's United Bank, just our cash account, there's $2.8 million in the bank right now. Of that $2.8 million, 177 of that cash already belongs to the tax stabilization fund. So there's no, there's no risk moving it from the tax stabilization fund. It's already got, You'd move it out it's already got at least 17% of its portfolio is in cash right now. Yeah. And there's probably more cash in the money market at Edward Jones, where it's invested. So moving it into this fund to take risk off the table isn't what you need to do, because we can, we can manage that portfolio and manage the risk within the tax stabilization fund. So it's, it's not a matter of risk. Um, I think it's just a matter of philosophy in terms of the movement. There have been many years where there's, let's say, been a million dollars at Edward Jones, and there's a fifty thousand dollar transfer that's going to happen. And all you do, accounting, you credit one fund and you debit the other fund, and that just means that the transfer has been made on paper, but there's still a million dollars in Edward Jones. We've got enough cash, mm -hmm. so it's just you know you you just do it for accounting purposes. Um, you know, I think. This conversation, I, I think it's better for what are we going to make a transfer in the budget in 2022 as opposed to 2021 right now because I agree with what Mark said. 
the 2021 budget was built, we, we had a tax rate of 53 cents or whatever it was. That 53 cent tax rate paid for everything. We've got a lot of money that we're going to be able to bring forward this year. Um, <coughs> and, you know, if you decide, well, let's put more money in the capital funds for future paving or bridge work or something, you can, you can do that. But I, I think moving the money in 21 at this point, it's, no, just, yeah. it's, just a, it's just a balance sheet uh, exchange because you either get it in a fund balance at the end of the year or you bring the current fund balance forward and you, you budget $50,000 for next year and you're in the same place. So. No, what I meant was think about putting it into this next year's budget <coughs> 2022. <coughs> right. To, you know, not only help serve the purpose in which it was created for, which is to try to keep, I mean, even if from an inflationary standpoint, if inflation, because I'm seeing, I mean, I just bought four pallets of uh, uh, sewer drain pipe today because it's so scarce and the cost is just, you know, I, I did that to have it to right. not be right. impacted. And if the 50000 can go even just towards neutralizing the inflationary impacts that we're having, I think it's money better yeah. spent. I, I think for the 2022 budget, it's certainly right. on the table to put money in there. I'm just thinking right now, it doesn't make sense to move that from 2021 because we're in a very good position. And the other comment I wanted to make, uh, and maybe this wasn't the right time to do it, I was kind of thinking that there might be a different time that I could have said it, but you know, the fact that you budgeted, you structured the budget last year the way you did and you were projecting those shortfalls that never came to fruition, in your eyes, did the temp I don't believe, and maybe you can confirm this, that we didn't, the town didn't suffer one iota from your, your budget prediction and the fact that we kind of lived under that budget and then the, what actually came to fruition was the surpluses. You know, that's been my philosophy and conversation to people right along when they talk about tax revenues versus uh, tax rates. And I keep telling them the secret is, in my, at least in my eyes, is to create a town budget that, and you've done a terrific job over the years, that is, is uh, as fiscally responsible as possible. And as your grand list grows or as your revenue source grows, um, and I think if you ask a lot of people, how many people have ever seen it, you know, in other towns, how many t people have ever seen their tax rate go down? Well, it's because the dog's always chasing his tail and, and the more revenue that comes in, the more that seems to get spent. And the only way of reversing that is to do exactly what you did last year in, in a sense and structure the budget that's just fiscally responsible and conservative and, and uh, as the revenue stream grows over time, the tax rate should go the other way. Instead of going up, it should go down. I mean, we can't the school, control school education costs, but from the town's perspective, uh, yeah, I don't think we were hurt one iota. We didn't lack for anything last year, and it, and now, you know, because of what was done, you look at the surplus moving forward. Right, I think we're, we're going to be there. in a, we're going to be in a pretty good place, and and I haven't done a lot of budgeting for the expense side for 2022 yet. I, I've started, but, um, you know, I think last year we put together a, a spending budget that was, I thought, rather tight, but I encouraged the department heads, you know, if we don't need to spend something, you know, you've got the money to do this. And obviously we tried to do things in particular in the highway department and with sidewalks and in the parks to keep up with the things that we had to do. But you'll see when we go through this that not only do we have significant above in revenues, but most of our 
spending, we were able to spend less even than we budgeted. So, um, and Nick's done a great job as well. Yeah, and and you know the challenge is that um, you know, and I'm I've never been the type to tell people that well, you know, if you don't spend your budget, you're not going to get that money next year, right? So I don't want to punish people. And if they've got a $25,000 budget and they only spent 20 last year, if they come back and they ask for 28, I might say, well, why do we have to go up from 25? But, you know, I would not punish them and say, well, I'm not going to budget 23 because you, you know, you only spent that out of a $25,000 budget, unless there was some structural issue that happened that you could say that's a long-term savings. But anyway, um, I think for, for right now on the tax stabilization fund, we're, we're fine where we are now. Um, just a little bit on the <clears throat> spending side for 2021. Uh, I put most of this stuff. Uh, I had yellow and green highlights in the budget information that I sent out. Uh, most of the time yellow, there's an explanation as to why it's um, higher than it was budgeted and the green is um, <clears throat> most of the time the green is in the proposed columns and talking about why it's higher than it looked before. So in the general government budget, <clears throat> which is the one budget that we can actually talk about my proposed 2022 spending because it's here. Um, on the budget side from 2021, we overspent some on the health department, I mean the health insurance line because an employee had a change in their family's status for employment, uh, spouse lost one job, took a different job, and therefore the, our employee who is declining coverage or taking a lower um, coverage uh, had, to, had to bump up. So we were up about $4,000 up on that budget, $3,500. Um, the Memorial Day, 4th of July, again, that's kind of an accounting issue. We didn't really spend any money for the fireworks display that we had last year in 2021. Uh, we actually paid it in 2020. Uh, they didn't do the display in 2020. We let them keep the money. We didn't ask for it back and just said, put it on account. But the way accountants work, you have to show the expense in the year that it happened. So it was a prepaid asset that we had in our on our balance sheet uh, from 2020, which inflated the fund balance a little bit. And then it shows that we overspent the budget in 2021. Um, on that line, uh, Danny in particular, um, so if we pay, the town has paid for the fireworks display for the not quite Independence Day since around the time of the flood. The Rotary Club used to do all of it on their own, the 4th of July committee before them did it, and uh, you know the town didn't pay anything. Um, the town now is uh, has been paying for the fireworks display since around 2010, I think, and um, we get more bang for the buck, so to speak, if we pay. Literally, <laughs> if we pay by the end of January. So um, uh, unless the select board doesn't want to see $14,300. And it's about, of that $14,300, I think they put it in the memo, uh, some of that is for um, you know, paying for the security at the, uh, at the not quite Independence Day. Um, some of it is for the trash removal. And then the balance of it is for the uh, yeah, it's on the bottom of MQID. Section. And then there's, uh, there is $500 there for the Legion that they use at Memorial Day, if they remember to ask for it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so you might, if you sign the orders, you might see a bill going out to North Star Fireworks this month. So unless the board doesn't want to get a little bit of a, they give about a 10% premium, if you will, if you pay early. So. Um, and the money we earn in the bank is about, you know, 0.25%. So it's no big loss to us. Um, 
So before we talk about 2022 in the general fund, let's just run through. We already talked about the fire department budget. Um, we'll come back and talk about the health and human services budget. The recreation budgets you'll see in the pool. Uh, you know, we spent about $20,000 less than we budgeted, uh, but we, we took in for pool fees um, about $6,100 more than we anticipated. So that was about a, uh, you know, $26,000 to the good. Can you, can you explain how we are so under on regular pay for pool? Yeah, we were under for regular pay because two reasons. One, um, we didn't do a lot of the winter, um, we, we rent space at either what was first in fitness up in Berlin or in Stowe at the um, Golden, Eagle. Golden Eagle, thank you, uh, to do uh, winter lessons. And we, because of COVID, we weren't able to do quite a bit of those. And then uh, we lacked staff at the pool. Um, we paid overtime, but we, we had fewer lifeguards than we had hoped. Um, and I think the pool was actually not open. I think on um, at least one weekend day, we were closed because of staffing issues. So uh, we, were, we, we were down on that level. Um, in the programs, there you can see about, you know, a forty-six, forty-seven thousand dollar over overage in the budget, and that's because we ran all of those uh, after-school programs and uh, the one day a week last spring that that uh, the kids didn't go to school. There was a program on those Wednesdays, so uh, Nick, as I said, scrambled and was able to put that programming together. You can see that big jump is really down two thirds of the way in that, where it says uh, many uh, programs uh, just below field trips. That's almost all of those after school programs and uh, uh, week long vacation camps, as well as that one day a week. And in the programming revenues, uh, we were right on schedule for programs, but mini camps, we were $55,000 above uh, what we anticipated. So again, we took in more money there than we spent in terms of the overage is concerned. Uh, uh, hey, so for that, was the um, Thanksgiving break camp that he put on, was that successful? Did that have a lot of interest in it? Uh, I know it ran, I don't, I, you know, some of those programs, especially when we get into the winter months, are constrained just because of space. You yeah. know, the, the rec building is pretty small and you can't, you know, you can't, in the summertime, you can have a program and run 100 kids out of there, but they're outside, they're at the pool, but during the winter, you gotta have enough space. So you can ask that question next week when Nick is here, but I think it was fairly successful. And he didn't put one on for Christmas break? Um, he. There I was something, did. yeah. yeah they had to did. cancel a day or two because the like, school closed early. Yeah, they had one, they shut down. Shut the day down the up. school was closed right. because of COVID, they closed. But they, they had a mini camp yeah. uh, between Christmas and New Year's. Um, let's see. Rec administration, that was pretty much spot on. It was only over because we spent a little bit more money for Nick and he worked a lot of overtime. So uh, parks, um, <clears throat> right now it's showing uh, for part-time pay $29,550. Uh, some of that is going to get moved into a different department. The work was done, but some of that was done in uh, work in the cemetery. So I'll transfer some of that overspending into the cemetery fund. It will all balance out in terms of, you know, uh, it was, it's all for town, uh, town work, but it's just a different department. And it looks like right now that that was terribly overspent and it's not quite that bad. Um, Steve will be here in two weeks to talk about the planning department's budget. Uh, but you can see here that 
there's a little bit of overspending for the regular pay line. Um, I've given Steve a couple of bumps in his pay uh, since he's been doing the work of the zoning administrator since Dina left in July. And uh, I don't know if this board knows, but the, the last person that you appointed didn't take the job oh. either. So we're Did still, we're still. I was getting oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. It's <clears throat> well, it seems like know? Steve knows better than I, but it seems like he uh, played us off against his current employer. Uh, <laughs> his current employer, his cover, cover, current employer gave him a pretty big raise from what I understand. Well, they had another job. <clears throat> yeah, I talked to him. One of his references was his current supervisor. He basically told me that they were looking at him for another position. Oh. <laughs> That's the end of the deal. Yeah. Gotta do what you gotta do. So anyway, we'll uh, we'll be back at some point. Come on. It's partly this stupid process that the state law requires yeah. that yes. doesn't allow us to act um, proactively. Really, you know, you, it's just you got to get the planning commission to make a nominee, and then your board has to end up deciding to. There's nothing the we person. can do about that. Well, we can. Get not, a, we can make a char get yeah. a charter. Right? Yeah, but you're not going right. to get a charter maybe. In the next, in the next, well, maybe we need to really seriously consider starting that. Well, we're going to talk about that well, yeah. in this budget process. Okay. Not tonight, but yeah, yeah. in this Why budget process. Done, I'm on. Um, oh, God. We can't keep finding ourselves no. in this situation. So the planning department uh, was underspent, and the underspending the planning department is almost wholly due to the fact that uh, we didn't have a zoning administrator since Dina left. <coughs> um, debt management is pretty simple. Special articles is pretty simple. So right now, uh, the, uh, the projected ending fund balance in the general fund for uh, December 31st, 2021 is $201,000, which will be carried forward into, into next year's budget. Uh, as I said at the beginning, that number will probably go down some from where it is now because we will not get any more revenue from 2021, but we will have a few more expenses. So that number will probably ratchet down a little bit. But you can see that the total expenditures right now are 2,842,000 and I'm projecting it's going to be 3,046,000. The big discrepancy there is the, I gotta beg the state to bill us for the police contract. Mm. I mean, they're supposed to send us a bill every quarter. I had to uh, get after them in August and say, you haven't billed us for the last two quarters of the first contract that we had. So they finally got a bill out for that $182,000 in September, I think it was, and then I was looking the other day, they didn't bill us at the end of uh, September like they should have, and they didn't bill us yet at the end of December. Huh. So uh, that will come eventually, and we'll pay it. But uh, if they're not in a hurry for it, I, you know, it's one of those things I start wondering, why am I bugging them right. for it, you know? Take <laughs> our money. They need, they need somebody like my wife to take care of their business, right? <laughs> yeah. You get the bills paid. Anyway, uh, highway fund. Um, kind of the same thing there. Um, property taxes for the highway fund, they get all of their taxes. The delinquencies show up in our, in the general fund. Um, I already can tell you that if you go back to the front page of the budget report, where it shows that our property taxes are, um, it shows that they're about 108,000 below budget, and then I, I discounted that again. So we build uh, 2.172. Uh, it says that we've collected 2.64. That's really what the general fund build, and it's all because of the uh, people who file their homestead declarations late, and that that top line there fluctuates between the time we uh, bill it in the time we get it. But um, we only have about $123,000 of 2021 taxes delinquent. That includes penalty and interest. Um, 
which is, you know, that means we've collected more than 98% of, of our taxes. And we'll be able to uh, count as collected in 2021 anything that we collect through the end of February. <coughs> so I, that, that alone might actually keep this fund balance kind of close to where it is because uh, yeah, we've just, done quite well with tax collection. I'm just thinking if we had that extra hundred and whatever you just said, that would... Yeah, so we'll, we'll probably get that down to close to 100 before we have to stop counting. In the highway budget, we did the same thing uh, with the Vermont state aid in the highway fund. Uh, that's general Vermont state aid. Uh, we got, actually we've got an increase. The legislature provided more money than they have ever in the general state aid. So we budgeted 85, but we collected 120, 500 almost. So that builds fund balance there in the highway fund. The two lines over in the right that are in yellow highlighting, uh, the highway labor materials and the pool cross charges, those haven't happened yet. So that money will come over, uh, but it shows up in, in my projected column already. So it is factoring into that fund balance. But spending is down. Uh, I'm projecting it's going to be down by about um, what $35,000 or so from what was budgeted. Uh, and uh, it's looking like we'll carry a pretty hefty fund balance forward. We had a, a good fund balance um, to begin 2021 in the highway fund. We had 143250 we were anticipating using all of that and ending the year with zero, um, but it looks like uh, we're gonna have a current year fund balance uh, or a surplus in the current year of about 150, this says 158,000. So we'll end up with a fund balance of over $100,000 again if this all comes to fruition. So um, things look pretty good there. And then in the library fund, the same thing, except to a lesser degree. They were spot on, really, with revenues. They did get uh, uh, some additional do donations that they weren't anticipating, uh, and a few more uh, non-resident fees that they weren't anticipating. Uh, the, the donations, as they should have been, have been spent. You'll notice that down toward the bottom of the expense line. They spent just about what they took in or I guess exactly what they took in, which is uh, how it should be. Um, but it, you know, the library's fund balance looks like it's going to be about $17,800, which is about $17,800 more than we anticipated. So all those things together lead us to a, a, a fund balance coming forward that is quite strong compared to what it's been in the past couple of years. So um, it's all good news. So any questions on the spending? And again, you don't have to ask them all tonight, but if you have questions, uh, you can ask any time during the budget process. <coughs> if you don't have any questions about 2021 revenues and expenses, we can talk about two of the budgets tonight. The general fund or the general government budget in the general fund, that's the budget that pays for all of the front office staff as well as myself and uh, Michelle who work out in the, in the old building. Uh, Barb Farr, her pay for 2021 and all the years prior to that is in that top line. We budgeted 349, 200 last year. Uh, looks like we're going to be a little bit overspent uh, at 352, 282. Uh, part of that is just due to the nominal pay increase that I asked you about a couple weeks ago. That factors in there, and then there's a little bit more. Uh, Barb had a little bit more time than anticipated, but. 
the $308,000 that's proposed there in 2022 uh, does not include any money for Barb's position. Um, but it's not a complete savings because, as I said in the memo, um, we had uh, $25,000 budgeted to receive uh, reimbursement from the state for that position. I can't remember the percentage that the state paid for of Barb's time, but it was, it turned out that they paid about $31,000, and I think her total expenses probably were close to 75 or 80. So they were, they paid about probably a third of, of her uh, expenses. So the fact that the budget line for regular pay is going down is not a complete savings because we're shedding Barb's uh, pay, but we're also losing out on that reimbursement. Um, the $308,000 does include two and a half months worth of overlap between myself and whoever is sitting here next year at this time. <coughs> and as I said in my memo, that's kind of weird to say even. <laughs> uh, doesn't, doesn't quite feel right yet, but that's what it is. Health insurance, um, it's a little up next year for two reasons. One, uh, as I said, the, there, we had one employee who, who bought up mid-year this year to a, a family plan, I think, as opposed to the two-person plan that they were on. And then uh, there's also money in that 92695 to pay for a couple months' worth of health insurance for the new person as well. Um, and there's nothing else really here that's anything of a big deal. Um, right in the a little bit lower than the middle of the page, the two MBOF, that's the Municipal Building Operating Fund. Um, what happens is we have a, a different fund, Fund 76 is where all the expenses for this building are shown. And we pay for the insurance and for the heat and the lights and the building maintenance and everything out of that Fund 76. The revenue source for that Fund 76 is uh, 53% of it comes from the library and 47% of it comes from the municipal, from the general government budget, and it's simply based on square footage. The library is about 53% of this building. Um, but that number is a number that has to be backed into, and I haven't got the information from Bill Woodruff about what Fund 76 is going to cost yet. So it's going to be whatever Fund 76 needs and then we pay, or this budget pays 47% of it. So that 55, 9, 10 is a rough estimate right now. Uh, it's going to change. I don't know how much. The county taxes. Um, Before you go yeah, down, yeah. Bill, I wonder, I'm looking at the training line yep. item, <clears throat> and I wonder about including a higher item to consider ongoing training either from Mary or another. Um, facilitator, knowing that the board is going to change each year, and even if not, it's something that maybe we want to include department heads in as well, since they didn't have the opportunity to do that. Um, and whether yeah, we go that, in that line, that, or not. that's fine by me. And, yeah. and training, you know, that that's pretty low anyway. I mean, right. uh, we do we do encourage uh, employees to get training. Some of the training comes in other line items such as um, you know managers professional development that would be training mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> and there's some training that gets paid for in the um, professional services line item up above because some of those things are uh, trainings that we get through our uh, the company that provides our accounting services but sure, but especially with dollars is not a lot. Right. So if you think that should go up, yeah, and especially with knowing someone, although it would be yeah, that like someone new coming in in the manager position, <clears throat> there might be more need than usual in that line. I don't know about in twenty two necessarily. Yeah, that but would probably be twenty three. Yeah, yeah. You took the words right out of my mouth. I right. figured with a new manager coming on board, 
don't take this the wrong way. You're an old hat, Bill. You, you know <laughs> everything that's kind of going on, but it depends upon who we have, what their experience is. I think there's going to be a, a fairly significant need for, for, for training for that new person. Yeah, and I would think that, you know, my expectation is you're not going to you're not going to be hiring the 28 year old. Right, we're not going to hire the kid that, right out of college and stuff that like came that. here. Uh, you're going to have to get somebody who had more experience. Right, has more experience than I had when I took this because this job is very different now than it was back in 1988. Yep. But I think the training for that person is mostly going to be in 2023. 23. Yeah. But you're right. If you're thinking of board training, Danny, in mm -hmm. particular, yes, yeah. um, you know, a thousand dollars isn't going to cut it. So, um, you know, you tell me what number you want there. You spent uh, almost all of that twenty nine thirty one. Because there's also some of the VLCT stuff that I don't know that most of us didn't take advantage of this year. I think due to it not being in person, and yeah. I know. For myself, like I've got a lot of learning to do, and I'd like to yep. take advantage of more of that right. as well. Um, so I don't know the number right now, but it's well, something we could. I would, I would say you should put five. Four, there. five, yeah. Yeah, I mean you spent forty-two this right. year, forty-three. <laughs> so five is a reasonable number. And you know whether you folks decide that you want additional DEI training or not, that's immaterial. You know you have mm -hmm. you'll have some money, and you can figure out what you want the training for. Um, Bill, I just was this is on my head, and I, I might not be on topic exactly, but where's the the match for the two percent? Where is that in the budget for uh, the big dig? Because that's falling off, right? That like, yeah, that's in that's in uh, one of the CIPs, and okay. we're not, so and that right. will be going away, or do yeah. we still have one more? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, they'll they'll. Everything there, just about everything there will be charged back to 2021. We're waiting for one last final invoice. Uh, Barb was in today to try to figure out whether we had that invoice or not yet. But the payment for the Main Street project is pretty much going to be a 2021. There might be a little bit of spillover into 2022, but um, that will be adjusted in the um, Fund 71. The, uh, infrastructure CIP. So that could mean, all things being equal, that you could have a lower transfer from the highway department into the CIPs. But again, we'll talk about that going forward. You might want to just roll whatever you were spending there and but put that, it in for bridges. That 2021 20, transfer to CIP, when that payment's made to the state, that does not hit the, the payment doesn't hit the budget? It hits it hits fund seventy one, which you don't have in front of you okay. here. So these these are just the operating budgets. Yeah. So if you look at the highway fund budget, yeah, fund, fund twelve. If you look at fund twelve, down at the bottom, you see that we sent five hundred eighty four thousand dollars to the CIP fund. Some of that went into fund seventy one, and that's where we paid for the Main Street project. So. Um, if there's savings there, what I'm saying, you could lower that line, right. or you could maintain it. You could maintain that and just, you know, target more bridges or what have you. But we'll we'll talk about that at a later date. Um, so back to that general government budget. Um, <clears throat> Right now, it's coming in slightly less than last year. If we add the five thousand dollars or four thousand dollars to that training line, they'll bring it up. It'll be pretty close to last year's budget level. Uh, the county tax line. Did everybody understand that? Um, yeah. It's a reduction. We spent eighty-four thousand in twenty twenty-one, and I'm projecting sixty-six five seventy right now. Um, the county offered us in 2020 to not make our full payment because of COVID, and we took advantage of it. So we, instead of paying that in November of 2020, we, we paid it in 2021 along with our first 2021 payment. So we paid more money this year. Just allowed us to keep a little bit of money in the bank 
when we still were a little bit uncertain about where we were going to end last year. <clears throat> so that's that. Um, any questions there I'm on the curious, general government budget? If there's anything, you know, cause, like Chris made the point of not seeing like um, you know detrimental consequences from having that more conservative budgeting. And so I'm curious if there was anything that didn't get funded or anything that, that might have felt some sort of pressure or consequences that would need to get funded in 22. Yeah, not in the general government budget. Sure, okay. That, that budget is pretty much to run the administrative mm -hmm. portion of, of the operation. Uh, so I don't think there it would show up. It may show up, Danny, when we talk about the fire budget or the planning budget mm -hmm. or the rec budget or highway budget, those, those kind of places. But the general government budget, no. Mm -hmm. All right? <clears throat> so with that, I'd, I'd like to just talk about this social services budget. <laughs> and uh, I did make a rather bold um, proposal here. I'm not asking you to approve it tonight, but I'd like to at least talk about it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the health officer position and the animal control officer position in particular are concerns of mine. Um, as I said in my memo, uh, the state requires <clears throat> towns to appoint a health officer. And what happens is the select board nominates someone to be the health officer for the community, and then the State Department of Health uh, appoints that person. And the health officer is really an agent of the state, if you will, uh, gets its authority through state statutes, and uh, the health department commissioner is really kind of in charge of all the health officers except the state doesn't do anything or fund any of that. They just, Fire. they just give you a rule book and say, this is what your authority is and this is what your responsibility are. Um, if no health officer is appointed by the select board, the chairperson of the select board mm. by default is the health officer. We do not have a health officer now. I don't know if they've caught up with Mark uh, but I don't know if they ever call. I have gotten calls. I have gotten calls. Yeah. So technically, right now, Mark is the health officer. I am the deputy health officer, and I have been for pretty much the whole time that I've been here in town. Um, the health officer position in, in towns like Waterbury, in towns like Waterbury, are typically not proactive at all. Uh, it's a reactive position. You wait until the phone rings and somebody says, I've got a problem. Most times the health officer gets called for two things, dog bites and rental housing inspections. The dog bites are um, if somebody gets bitten by a dog, they go to their doctor or the emergency room. Uh, the, the medical provider is obligated by law to contact the town health officer. They usually do that through Carla. They, they send her an email or a fax comes to Carla and she gets it to me. And then, or the health officer, but since we don't have one, it comes to me. And then I have to, uh, I have to contact the person who is bitten, try to get some information from them. If we had an animal control officer, a lot of the information about the bite would have been investigated by the ACO and shared with the health officer, but we don't have an ACO right now either. We haven't had since Peter Trammell left a few years ago. But then the health officer has to call the owner of the dog if it can be identified, and the dog is supposed to be quarantined for a certain period of time. First, you've got to find out whether the dog has had its shots. If it's had its shots, you Tell the person, okay, you got to keep the dog quarantined, which is basically should keep it inside or 
on a leash in a fenced area and don't let it have contact with any other uh, animals or people for 10 days. And if the dog, if the animal shows any signs of um, unusual behavior or illness, then you got to go to your vet and, you know, and then you got to follow up. Um, the other thing that the health officer gets called for is people call up and say, I live in such and such a, a building in apartment C on such and such a street number. Um, Joe Smith is my landlord and I've got black mold in my house or the heating system won't work and you know on a on a day that's I think <clears throat> I think when the ambient air temperature is 55 or below the heating system has to be able to get the the, the living space to 62 degrees or something like that anyway you get called for to do a rental housing inspection and it used to be you could go and do the inspection for what they called for legislature changed the law two years ago now when you get called to go for a rental housing inspection you're supposed to inspect all of the all of the unit for every one of the items so you're looking at electrical you're looking at plumbing you're looking at all kinds of different things not to not that i'm a plumbing inspector but just to see does if you turn the hot water on does hot water come out of it does water go down the drain um you know do they have a working toilet that kind of stuff um and you've got to write a report and you've got to put it on file and if if you find there's a rental housing code violation you got to contact the landlord and you got to tell them they've got to take such and such an action in such and such a period of time and then you're going to go back and look at it again it takes a lot of time and you hope nobody ever calls because you don't want to do it right and it's it's i do it because there's nobody else to do it um, <coughs> the state last year <coughs> came close i think the governor actually vetoed uh, legislation requiring there to be a rental housing registry in every town where if that law passed and i'm sure the legislature is going to bring it up again <coughs> They're going to want uh, an, an inventory of all rental housing units. And the LCT is trying to get the state to say, you shouldn't have local health officers doing these inspections anymore. You should put it on the Department of uh, Fire Safety, Public Safety. It's the Department of Public Safety, but the, the fire division or whatever. But they don't have enough inspectors to do that. So I don't know if that will ever happen. Uh, I didn't propose it here, but there are towns, uh, St. Albans, City, uh, Montpelier, I think Winooski, um, I'm not sure about Stowe, but there are towns that have said, well, we're going to have our own, they don't write their own uh, housing standards, they just adopt the state's codes for standards, but they require a, a registry and they require all of the property owners to pay a fee and then they use that fee to hire a person and they go out and they might inspect you know 20 percent of all the units in any given year and then over a five-year period you get into every building and of course if somebody calls with a complaint you go and deal with that i'm not suggesting that here but <clears throat> that's a situation that takes some time and it's something that needs to be done uh, I think you were on were you on the board when we dealt with the rat issue on Stowe Street mm -hmm. that that took me and Steve Simos who was the health officer at the time and I was the deputy um, I must have spent uh, a month almost full time you know not a month straight but 40 hours a week times four just dealing with that rat infestation issue had to get joe mclean involved from you know stencil page and fletcher we probably spent 10 grand on that particular issue 
So I'm not going to be here after this year. And the other issue is that you've brought it up several times, Mike. Gary Dillon has brought up parking around the school. We've got business owners, not so much the last few years because of the Main Street project, but now that's done. And if we ever get back to normal, there's going to be an expectation that our parking ordinances need to be enforced a little bit, at least. And if they're not going to be enforced, we shouldn't even have them. Why should we put signs up that say it's two-hour parking or 15-minute parking if we don't care how long people stay there? So I don't know if you can get a person to do these jobs for $50,000 a year, but I think you ought to try that. I, I think in this the 2021 budget, I've got six months worth of that in there. Uh, and then the, the column to the right of the uh, proposed column, which isn't headed. So for 2021, I mean 2022, the cost to, for the social services uh, department would be almost $75,000 um, compared to 21000 that we budgeted last year. 13500 of that is to the um, public health. Uh, that, you know, that's a standard payment we make every year. But all that that's highlighted in green is additional is additional. So uh, this year that would be what, 75 minus 15 would be about 60. And then I, I showed you what the 2020, uh, 2023 budget would look like. And the reason why it's not doubled is because there's a vehicle there. I've got you know, $15,000 to buy a used vehicle that the person could use uh, to do their patrolling. You know, we've got a uh, winter parking ban right now, and the way that we enforce that right now is we have a, a deal with a towing company, and we basically say, you know what, um, they're not supposed to park on the street from whatever it is, midnight or one o'clock to, to, to six in the morning, and um, we don't have a police department anymore, so we're not out there writing tickets, we're not out there trying to find people um, if they're on the street you got to tow them out of there. We haven't had any, any complaints this year. Last year I had several complaints. It usually, complaints usually start coming in in February because it doesn't seem like winter weather gets here much before that uh, of late. But <clears throat> that winter parking ban should be enforced. This person, you know, you'd have to allow the person to work some flexible time, uh, have to work sometimes at night to do that. Um, ACO, you know, if you saw the orders uh, last week or two weeks ago, we paid the town of Bolton $200 because the state police called Bolton's animal control officer because somebody down on Route 2 in Waterbury or Little River Road had lost a dog. They needed assistance. We don't have an ACO. They called the town of Bolton. The guy was willing to do it. Um, I don't know, he drove around, he, he drove for 200 miles looking for a dog. And I wrote the town clerk down there, I said, you know, it's not that important that the dog be found. I mean, you don't have to spend that much time. But we, we sent $200 there just to, you know, he had sent the bill to Bolton, and Bolton was saying, well, this is your stuff. Did we get a name? Uh, for the animal control officer. <laughs> yeah, he said he doesn't want to do anything with that. <laughs> I told him, I said, he can tell the state police, no, he doesn't yeah. have to come. But anyway, we don't have one. And that kind of thing, you know, happens. But we have, the, the, we had one dog bite this year. I don't know, did you hear about it? Or some, one of you, somebody heard about it. There was a dog bite, I think, in the parking lot uh, between the, the uh, sporting goods store and Kathy Cummings building somebody there and there was a couple from Massachusetts they got out of their car and their dog just attacked this woman and uh, bit her uh, terrible injuries she ended up being hospitalized for several days and needed surgery and uh, you know the people fortunately 
who owned the dog stepped up, and from what everything I understand, they've made the person whole, and you know, so, but the animal control officer should have investigated that. There should have been, you know, we've got a dog ordinance, a vicious dog ordinance, there should have been a fine. Um, I don't care about the fines, but it's just the service that we're not offering right now. So I don't know if you're going to get anybody to bite if we advertise for this job, but I think you ought to try. I agree, Bill. It's all these unfunded mandates that we have. We have all these things that need to be done, <coughs> and we're just kind of, they're out there. And why, as you said, why have them? if they're not going to be enforced, at least in some way, shape, or form. You know, I don't expect full compliance, you know, but I think, you know, you know, it's going to get to the point with parking, and, you know, people are just going to say, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to park well, there all day. We, we've got, and it's, it's not just the parking in the downtown. I right. Mean, we've spent a lot of time here dealing with the Blush Hill access. Yeah. We've spent a lot of time, he, some time here dealing with um, Sweet Road and the Hunger Mountain access. Steve yeah. has has had to help me. He stepped in, uh, you know, and we're trying to figure out a way to 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 get something uh, solved there. Maybe the state should have bought the property that I told them they should have bought 25 years ago. But you know, Steve's working with me on it. But you know, I had uh, uh, gentlemen in the library this morning. I mean, he said, well, you've got all these, you know, you've got uh, one of the property owners up there who's putting ropes up along the highway telling people like he doesn't want them parking in front of his, his property, even though it's the town highway right away and he can't regulate it. Um, so we've got that issue. We've got the Hunger Mountain, I mean, the, uh, the Blush Hill uh, boating access. We've had problems in the past in the going into the state park at the at the center where people have been parking all over the place there. We have issues at uh, the trailhead down at the ice center for the for the bicycle trails there. So, you know, I think, and then we have issues in, in the Hope Davy Park. I mean, Tom and Meg are still here. We've got, you've all heard about the conflicts with the, uh, disc golfers and the walkers and you've got people that are engaging in bad behavior and you know I mean what can we do now if we get that kind of complaint it's either you got to find Nick and try to send him up there and he's busy doing his programming or working with kids or I've got to go or Bill Woodruff has to go I'm not sure it's it's not the be all and end all but I've just been throwing it out there as something to consider. And you don't have to decide tonight, but I just think that... You could look at it a little bit like, look at what the village had before merger. Their police budget was over $400,000, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. And yeah. this was back five, ten years ago. You know, we've gotten this state contract. Who knows the longevity of our option to be able to continue to utilize that product. But right now, that is saving the town money, but what it doesn't allow us is the certain elements, some of which you're describing in this position. So it almost makes that missing component of the police department whole by bringing in that element. Plus, I do believe we have some responsibility to make sure that housing mm -hmm. is safe and that landlords are following the, the rule book set forth. And if we're not, I don't, I feel like that's a Problem. Yeah, and I, I thought about that part of it a little bit yesterday, and I described how some communities have put in this, uh, this registration fee system to generate income to have these inspectors in place. <coughs> I think, I don't, from the way I think about it and from what I've seen, I'd almost think it's better if the town just funds that through taxation makes everybody pay a little bit of it. Um, I've been in a lot of really, really substandard places that mm -hmm. none of you would even want to go in, never mind live in. And if you, if you try to make the property owners pay for it, then you have all the property owners who are good landlords 
paying the long dollar, which is only going to make their housing costs go, go higher, up, yeah. right? So I think you could, if you had this position, you could work with the state code, um, talk about, um, you know, get information from other communities about what they do for inspection, but just do that through the, the budget as opposed mm -hmm. to having a, a fee structure. You can look at it both ways, and there's pros and cons to both, mm -hmm. but um, I think something more than what we're doing now is necessary. Mm -hmm. The one potential advantage to some kind of registration and small fee would just start to get some of the data surrounding long-term rental unit numbers mm -hmm. that we almost don't have right yeah, now. Yeah, that's true. And we and the fee doesn't have to be, I think it's something like, what was it, like $500 a year recommended? Yeah, or something. Yeah, I, don't oh, know there was the, something I don't know what the state was recommending. Oh, well, then that makes plenty, you know, that if it's 50 bucks a year, I don't see if that as a huge claim of, like, my rent is going to go up, you know, yeah. I need to raise that rent. That's what it is, is like a $50. Right, rent. okay. I don't know, I was reading something else. So that, yeah, so then I would agree, Mark, especially because, we, you know, housing is one of the big issues we're tackling now and going forward, so. Yeah, I and I think that's need to explore. I mean, obviously, we need to talk it through a lot. Right. To, to, to my mind, that that's the second issue so if you buy into this concept and you can hire somebody and you can hire the right person mm -hmm. then you can charge that person with doing some research mm -hmm. and getting information and potentially helping develop the fee structure i'm not sure that we're going to be able to do that between now and july if we right. even if we put this in the budget but i think having the Commitment. Even if we are not able to hire somebody right now, at least having the money available for that resource, and, mm -hmm. and if you have to bump up to pay or whatever, but uh, those are three areas right now where I think we're wanting in, in many respects. So, anyway. yeah. The housing one is going to be. I know because years ago I used to do that, but we had a big big stick to because we dealt with federally subsidized housing. So if you had some sort of deficient findings, you basically could threaten them with the loss of their, their housing subsidies, which was a big part of their income for their property. The ones that don't have any subsidies, that's a real challenge. You know, you know the small mom and pop ones that, you know, a lot of them are really good landlords, but you know, there are some, you know, some bad actors out there and that's going to be the ones that's going to be hard to change. You know, what, you know, they may just be breaking, breaking even what they're doing. Right. You know? and it, but it goes both ways too. There's, oh, yeah. there's plenty of people that call up and you go there and you find out, yeah, well, the heat isn't working, but then you look around and you wonder how these people, how can they live in the conditions that they're living in and, you know, the, the trash that's building up, yeah. that's not the landlord's fault, you know, there's, it, it, it goes both oh, ways. Oh, some of it's definitely but, ten, ten and driven. Which, yeah, but that has nothing to do with the heat working, so. No, that's what I said. <laughs> if they call yeah, yeah. the heat, that's fine. <laughs> but there's other issues that you find that are not, not they're self-inflicted, if you will. Anyway, I don't have anything more for tonight. You don't have to make any decisions on any of this tonight. You're conspicuously silent so far. So. The list that you just gave of responsibilities for said person uh, is probably some of the most volatile mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and seemingly unchangeable. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm against this proposal, but. I guess it would be a wait and see uh, circumstances to just how effective this person could be with the, with the responsibilities given him. And uh, I just would hope that in the end it wouldn't be throwing good money after bad to try to solve problems that may well, ultimately not be solvable. Well, you know. In most instances, not to say that it wouldn't. Be. It wouldn't change some of it, but. I, I, the, the housing stuff is, that's the most challenging. Um, you know, animal control officer stuff, you can, if you have somebody that's willing to do it, and we, we, had, we had some issues with Peter, 
in terms of his bedside manner, but he was somebody that was willing to do the job and go out and actually do something. Um, and he did a lot of good. Uh, we had a few problems because of just his personality sometimes. Um, but a $50,000 salary, um, and then you add benefits, that is not, that's not significantly lower, and it might still be higher than most entry-level police officers are making in this state. You know, when we had police officers here, they haven't worked for us for since 2018, but, you know, they were in the $22, $23 an hour range, and that's, that's about 50 grand. I think $24 an hour is $50,000, so. So how much of that, just for clarification on my part, how much of what you're this consolidation kind of in a nutshell thing versus what we've already been spending on. How, are we talking about a wash or are we talking about 30% uh, additional cost, 20% additional cost? Well, we budgeted for, um, we budgeted for um, an animal control officer of $5,500 this year. We didn't spend anything because we didn't get anybody to do the job. And we had advertised trying to get somebody a few, several months ago, a year ago, I, we were advertising like 18 bucks an hour or something. We never, didn't get any, any, any takers on it. Uh, this is more money than was, than we've ever spent before. But I think part of the issue that I'm trying to get you to understand is not that the next town manager wouldn't be willing to be the health officer if you decided that was something that you wanted to make him do or her do. But I'm not sure it's really the best use of that person's mm -hmm. time. You know, it's, it's, it's something that I do just because I, you know, it's always kind of been an expectation. You, you try to deal with it. I don't, I mean, I don't slough it off but I, I do what I need to do to kind of meet the minimum requirements in case somebody complains that I didn't do something, but to really provide the service that people are expecting when they call for rental housing inspection. I mean, Beth Ann Mayer, she thought when she applied to be, or she volunteered to be health officer and the select board appointed her a few years ago, you know, she thought she was going to be able to make a difference. And then you end up with just being, you have no resources, you have no real authority, and you're just in the middle of a landlord-tenant dispute. So if you had somebody that really had the job and you provided some training and some information and, uh, you know, allowed them to be a little bit proactive, I think you can do better than it's being done now. And it's just, you know, I'll continue to do what I've been doing as long as I'm here, but I'm not going to be here. And I'm, I, I just don't think And just that, being reactive is I don't think we're doing right yeah. now what really needs to be done given the public's expectations. I mean, some of this stuff is, you know, from my perspective, is, is uh, based on the reaction that I've seen from... Uh, the population throughout the world, and especially this country in the last two years uh, with short tempers and uh, unreasonable reactions towards each other makes this position even more or less desirable. Yeah, it's, it'll, it makes it more difficult to fill. I think if we were having this conversation in 2015 and you offered a $50,000 salary to do these things, probably somebody would have stepped up. And you might be right, <coughs> but, but not being able to hire somebody, even though you have the resources to do it, is different than not, not being able to, not even thinking that it's something that we need to do. That's, it's, you understand it's like, you need to, you can't do anything unless you put some resources behind it. Uh, and if you're going to just continue with the status quo, that's your choice. But I'm not sure that 
is in the best interest of most of the public. Did we have a health safety officer line item? I can't remember. I don't think we did. There was money. Um, the health officer, um, yeah, the, we budgeted uh, $600 this year. Um, in the past, I think we've, I think we paid uh, like a hundred dollar a month stipend for it, and it was an afterthought last year. So, so basically, to Chris's comment earlier, we had about maybe about six thousand in the budget to represent some of what we're talking about for this role. So, incrementally, if fifty thousand dollars is the budget item, we're looking at a forty-four thousand dollars. Yeah, you got to add. You got to add and benefits, benefits yes. Yeah. So, so fifty, more, probably eighty thousand. Eighty-five thousand, yes. Yeah, probably, 80, 000, yeah, that's what it's I was probably saying. you know seventy-five to eighty thousand. But once you purchase the vehicle, then that you oh, purchase the vehicle, that but drops a little the bit. person, good. you know, <laughs> and, and I don't <laughs> even remember. Do that, I have to look. I have to look back to see how many hours a week. I think I budgeted forty hours for the job because I've got health insurance here. But can't we consider, because, you know, we were paying Bob Forrest position, so that kind of, you know, we're losing that salary. Yeah. No, that's what I was getting at. You know, how much of a difference so, in our, you know, that's, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, well, I, I, haven't, this, I, haven't, no, gotten, I, I haven't gotten there yet. Right. So, on top of that, I'll throw another curveball at you, which really isn't a curveball, but we had a, a fund that we were starting to... Uh, put money aside to uh, keep up with the maintenance of our buildings. Yeah. And that's getting up even faster than we're uh, creating it. And uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, it goes back to our conversation earlier about the tax stabilization fund. I mean, I'd like to start that line item out with $50,000 and build on that uh, because these buildings are starting to age a little bit, and they're yeah. going to start to need. And we put some money in there. Um, in there. Uh, so next meeting, I can I can give you the numbers. Yeah. This last year, I we put I think we only put like five or six thousand dollars. We got in. swallowed up like two weeks later. Yeah, well, heating problems. And yeah, but I don't think I paid for those heating problems out of that particular oh, budget. Okay. But anyway, you're you're not wrong. Um, Anyway, so yep. that's just food for thought. The other thing too, so you talked about Bob Farr's, uh some of the expenses going away and, and being picked up here, that's true. Right. I will tell you already, I think if you remember back to when Nick was here, he's, there's gonna be a request for an additional full-time person in the rec department because he cannot do what he's built now by himself and, and a bunch of part-time staff, so. Uh, and that'll come out of the revenue from the department. Right, there's, right? there's, there's, there's revenue. It's right. clearly, you know, there's, there'll be some <laughs> revenue to support that. Um, but these causes, it's not much. You know, it might be a little revenue, but fines or something like that, but not a lot. Yeah. So I see that budget surplus moving forward getting smaller well, and smaller. Well, not if he's able to grow capacity with a new we'll staff. See. In theory, I mean, I, don't, I haven't looked at the budget. Yeah. And some of the some of the revenue, of course, some of the revenue is for the rec programs is restricted by the building space that we right. have available to put kids in. You know, so mm -hmm. that's a different issue. All right. So. Um, because it, it came up um, during this, uh, we had talked when we were talking about parking at Hunger about looking at that pro land in terms of possibly. Providing more parking has that gone anywhere? So Were there we, more conversations? Yeah, exactly. We've contacted the state mm -hmm. about that, um, and the particular parcel I think that you're talking about is right now subject to a, a court uh, situation oh. that um, you've probably seen if you look at any of the bills that we get from Stitzel, Page, and Fletcher. There's this. Uh, Grayson Appeal, it's called. So oh. Grayson's got a permit. Um, it was from the DRB. This was a couple of years ago. Then what, they failed to file a plat or something like that? Well, uh, that's correct with the latest uh, permit. They, that's right. They had to reapply because they had not filed 
their final lack of the survey. So the first time they got the, the local permit, that was appealed. And then I don't know what happened with that, but then too much time went by. They didn't file their, their plat, uh, so they didn't get the permit. They reapplied. They got another permit from the DRB, which is being appealed by um, a, a neighbor. Mm. And um, so we're, so yes, we're pursuing that. Right. Really. Okay. Uh, but we don't have anything to propose yet. Holding, yeah. It's a little bit tied up in that court case. We had suggested to the, to our attorney, a potential settlement that would involve the state getting that particular mm. piece of land for parking, but until the there's some motions before the court that uh, we can't take any action until the judge makes some decisions. So. Um, and then lastly, I cannot recall the meeting where we voted about Act 250 and when that time deadline is up for appeal. Do you know the date, or maybe Carla knows it's the date? It's 45 days from the date that you I'll find program. the agenda. 45 days was December 29th, I think. So it's so we have passed. Soon. Well, no, it's 60 days total. Well, it's it's, but I think for appeal they have 45 days to get a petition. Right, that date is passed. So if that date is passed, then okay. it doesn't look like no petition has been turned in, as far as I know. Yeah, not that I'm aware. Of. So that means that your decision will will go into effect 60 days from, from that, that date. So okay. in a couple Two weeks, more weeks probably. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I wanted to mention one thing too. Um, forgot to bring it up at the beginning, but Steve Van Eason passed away. Yes. Oh, yeah. so sorry. Yeah. So I yeah. um, just want to say on behalf of the board, thank you for everything he's done for the town. For those who don't know, he was part of Pilgrim Partnership. A lot of the reasoning that coffee gro groceries grew in town. And I'm sure others know a lot more about his history in town, but um, don't ever think. Yeah. yeah, I actually was going to mention that. And I also wanted to mention that uh, as much heartache and, and I guess headbutting and, and uh, controversy, the banner created. Uh, I quite honestly am very pleased with what's hanging there and uh, think that it sends a subtle but strong message uh, that we need to start treating each other, each other fair and uh, on the same playing field. Um, and I'm glad we ended up with what we ended up with because I think it sets the town uh, separate from this turmoil that the rest of the country has gone through uh, by, by coming up, up with what we did. So I'm very pleased with it. We've had some positive feedback from yeah. the public too. But going back to what Mark said about Steve, maybe we should dedicate the next select board meeting in his honor. Yeah. Yeah, he's very involved in economic development. Yeah. Yeah, he's been many, many years that I was attending recently. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's not the time we're carrying. You could consider dedicating the annual report to him if you want. Yeah. Yeah, something like that would be nice. That would be more long. More visible. Yeah. Would have been good if we thought about it last year. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That's not a good point. But anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. The last thing that I want to just mention um, is that <clears throat> when I announced a couple weeks ago that I was going to be retiring, I did suggest that you uh, contact the LCT to see if they would help in a search. I don't know if you're interested in that or you want to do it all yourself. Um, but um, I really should, I mean, I, I can call them up and say, you know, uh, the board wants your help, but 
my fingerprints should not be mm -hmm. on who the next person is. So right. it really needs to be the board that does this if you're going to. And I can get you, Mark, um, should we contact Ted, Ted Brady's, Brady's uh, information well. and, uh, the and, okay. and uh, okay. you know, see what they might be able to do for, okay. for you. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. All right. I think we should put that. Use every resource we can. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, no, I think that's a good idea. Um, are you going to, we can all connect. Yeah, I'll, okay. yeah. I'll send something to you, Mark, and then you okay. can delegate as you decide. Sounds good. Uh, motion? One uh, last just yeah. point of order, um, just to make sure the meeting on Martin Luther King is that date, not because it's a holiday. I'm just making sure that we're on the Monday right. Monday the 17th. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now. I know now, sometimes with like on holidays we switch it to Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, so this may be something that the board might want to consider changing, but currently and for all time, Martin Luther King uh, Day is not a holiday that has been ever recognized by the town. We've always worked on that date. Yeah. So it's not one of the 10 holidays that we get off. Understand. I, I just wanted to make sure because again a lot of so the board meetings. My so, expectation know. is that every Monday in January, including that one, will be here. I have no problem with that. If everyone, if everyone else does. Um, next week I have another meeting, another board meeting that I have to give reports at, so I will be late to this one. Uh, I don't think it'll be more than an hour and a half or so, but I will be an hour and a half late or an hour and a yeah. half meeting? hour and a half late, probably. Okay. And there's still the Ice Center proposal that you put forward. Yeah, we've got to gotta talk about that, too. But. Will that be a February uh, probably conversation, or do you think we can? Some of it may have to be in the budget, so yeah, yeah. we'll talk about it. So okay. I, I'll, I won't do it next week, though. Okay. I need the full board here for that, and I know you have an interest in the ice center anyway, so we'll maybe talk about that on the 17th or 24th. Okay. Hey, motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye.